This is a pre-recorded presentation, so the presenter will not be taking any questions. However, all questions asked during the live presentation, along with answers, are included at the end of this presentation. To learn more about our upcoming patient and family conferences in your area, please visit aamds.org slash conferences. To view other recorded presentations or to register for other live online learning events, please visit aamds.org slash learn. Welcome to our live webinar titled Understanding Personalized Medicine for Aplastic Anemia, MDS, and PNH Patients. Thank you for joining us. My name is Lee Clark, Information Specialist at AAMDSIF, and I'll be moderating the presentation today. As we get started, I would like to acknowledge Celgene for providing an educational grant and the generous support of our patients, family, caregivers, and support of this webinar program also. Today's presenter is Dr. Patel. Dr. Patel is an Associate Professor of Pathology and Laboratory Medicine at the, Medi at the Medical and the medical director, I'm sorry, of the Molecular Diagnostics Laboratory for Hematological Malignancies and the Department of Hematopathology at the University of Texas MD Anderson Cancer Center. He is board certified in anatomic pathology, clinical pathology, hematopathology, molecular genetic pathology, and medical quality. In addition, he holds a PhD in cell biology and molecular pathogenesis. His clinical interests include interpretation of diagnostic workup for hem hematological malignancies and molecular diagnostics. His research focus is on uh, uh, patholog pathological malignant mechanism, sorry, in uh, hematological malignancies using uh, novel molecular techniques. He has more than 100 peer-reviewed publications to his credit. His current projects involve use of next-generation sequencing and identifying novel genetic mutations in hematological malignancies and translating this knowledge and to molecular diagnostic approaches for personalized cancer management. With that said, I, will, I have the pleasure of introducing Dr. Patel. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everybody, uh, and uh, thank you so much uh, for taking time this afternoon. It's a pleasure to be with you all. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to be participating in this uh, webinar series. I'll be presenting uh, some of the recent developments on aplastic anemia, MDS, uh, and PNH. Uh, so as the group would know, these are the bone marrow uh, disorders which result into a variety of uh, uh, cytopenias, meaning the decreased number of cell counts. So overall, the, the, the learning objectives for today's presentation are to understand the gene mutations and genetic testing, and also to understand how some of the testing can be useful in, in identifying and making the diagnosis, as well as the profiling of these conditions uh, in terms of understanding the prognosis as well as the therapies. And also we will try to go over some of the benefits and limitations of the genetic testing profiling uh, as, as uh, towards the end of the presentation. So here's uh, a brief overview of uh, what we are going to try and accomplish within the next 45 to 60 minutes. The, uh, we'll try to understand the normal hematopoiesis as the basis for the abnormal hematopoiesis and, and the diseases which are associated with them in the first part of the presentation. Also, we'll try to cover the genetic basis uh, of different uh, conditions and especially focusing on aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndromes. And in the second half of the presentation, we'll go over the clinical molecular genetic testing and how that's uh, being revolutionized and it's also playing a major role now in personalizing the care. In part one, we'll focus on understanding the hematopoiesis as well as the genetic basis of the disorders and, and in the later half, we'll focus on the clinical uh, testing. So as we would know, the hematopoiesis is 
the mechanism uh, for by which there is a, a renewal and, and supply of a variety of different cells in our body which provide a variety of different functions including carrying the oxygen, providing immune uh, response as well as uh, the uh, providing platelets for uh, controlling the bleeding and clotting. All of these come, on, come from a, a single pluripotent stem cell and it undergoes a series of differentiation through which uh, then we end up getting these mature and functional cells. The, the, this process is quite important and, and, uh, and intricate in the sense that it requires a series of differentiation steps which are heavily regulated through participation of multiple proteins and multiple signaling pathways. And this is a highly coordinated event whereby a single common cell can differentiate into a variety of highly specialized and, and functional cells. This process is also subject to age-related changes and also and vulnerable to uh, environmental damage uh, and also to other conditions such as nutritional deficiencies, immune conditions, and therapeutic agents. And these are all important things to keep in mind in that when we try to understand the patients who present with cytopenia, one or many of these could be at play uh, for these patients uh, when it comes to understanding the pathogenesis of the disease process that's ongoing. So uh, this process is really the basis of uh, providing us the understanding of different uh, types of cells and, and their maturation spectrum. Just a little bit uh, about the terminology. Um, I'm sure the, uh, the group doesn't need uh, a detailed orientation to this, uh, but the terminology will be hearing a lot about aplasia, um, dysplasia, and such. They all come from the terminology plasia, meaning the growth. Uh, and uh, hypoplasia, which is decreased growth. Uh, so plasia mean, meaning the growth or formation. And uh, from here, uh, the uh, word aplasia meaning no growth, hypoplasia meaning decreased growth, dysplasia meaning abnormal growth, or hyperplasia meaning increased growth. The way we use these terminologies in our classification of diseases is the bone marrow disorders are classified using a variety of these common descriptors. So, for example, using the chronicity, meaning how long the disease condition has been there, it can uh, be classified as either acute, meaning uh, relatively recent and within a short uh, period of time, or chronic, and this can be acute, can be further classified into AML or acute myeloleukemia, acute lymphoblastic leukemia, Similarly, chronic can be classified accordingly. Depending on the cell lineage that gets affected, the terminology can be classified into myeloid or lymphoid. Uh, the t depending on the type of defect, uh, it can be classified into aplastic, uh, which is an example for the aplastic anemia. And uh, looks like my audio is breaking up, so let me try uh, to change the source and see if I can sound better on the other source. Give me just a second. Okay, I'll, I'll try to speak through this source and see if it's uh, coming out better. Okay, so uh, depending on the type of defect uh, that we see, if there is no production there, uh, these are called aplastic conditions, such as aplastic anemia. If the production of cells is there, but they are not functional, um, we call them dysplastic, and these are the examples for MDS. Oftentimes, there is excess production uh, and proliferation, so these are the examples of MPN. At the same time, we also look at the maturation stage, and if the cells which are being produced are more immature, then we call them uh, acute myeloid leukemia or acute lymphoblastic leukemia. If the cells are maturing but the ab maturation is abnormal, then there are again uh, examples of MDS, MPN. And if the cells which are coming out are mature, uh, then they are called examples of CLL or chronic lymphocytic leukemia or myeloproliferative neoplasm. So as you could see from this uh, simpler, simpler classification schema, we take into account a variety of different uh, characteristics of these cells uh, to assign them into specific categories and the terminology which has so far been mainly uh, based on, on some of these common observations and that as we know has been changing rapidly
as we understand these conditions more at the genetic level. And now we try to classify these conditions along with some of these common descriptors for continuity as well as add these specific genetic abnormalities whenever they are understood so that they can be classified as a very specific condition. And this uh, forms the basis for the personalized care or personalized uh, cancer care. So when we take some of the, the spectrum that we just discussed, we can place the hematologic conditions that we are going to discuss into several groups, starting from failure to produce, produce these cells, which could mean uh, on, if only a single cell lineage is affected, such as red cell aplasia, or it could mean uh, that multiple con cells are affected, such as aneoplastic anemia, or it could be a bone marrow failure syndrome where entire bone marrow is failing. It may so happen that the cells are being produced but which are being destructed, such as in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, or the production is ineffective, such as in MDS-MPN. Or it could lead to an uncontrolled production, such as in MPN and AML. All of these conditions eventually uh, lead to exhaustion of the marrow supply, and, and that forms the basis for, for the marrow failure. But as we can see here, there are multiple, uh, there is a continuity uh, to some extent, and a spectrum of disorders which generally arise from and have carry one of these common denominators such as the failure to produce or ineffective produce production or uncontrolled production. So starting with the aplastic anemia and red cell aplasia, we know that the, uh, the condition as we define red cell aplasia means the, the cell line that's affected is mainly the red blood cells. And based on that, these are called red cell aplasia. This could be constitutional in origin, meaning that the, the, the defects which re give rise to these conditions arise are inherited, uh, and such is the example for diamond black fan anemia. Or it could be acquired uh, through the course of uh, the uh, life, such as in the cases of transient erythroblastopenia of childhood, or, or it could arise as part of the virus infection, or secondary to some other conditions. And, and some of the cases are idiopathic, meaning that we don't really know why uh, some of the uh, why there is a marrow suppression and why no red blood cells are being produced. So in these patients, by definition, the other uh, cell lineages such as myeloid cells and so, such as neutrophils and the lymphocytes are still being produced uh, uh, properly. Whereas in aplastic anemia, all cell lineages are affected to variable extent. And the examples of such conditions which arise constitutionally as, as an inherited disorder are multiple, such as Fanconi anemia, uh, erith uh, and dyskeratosis congenita, so on and so forth. When the same uh, condition arises uh, as an acquired defect, uh, it could be a secondary to many of the disease processes, could be idiopathic, or it could be uh, due to a clonal abnormality, such as uh, the case in paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobinuria, and I'll, I'll refer to this as PNH uh, for the future purposes. So when we look at the inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, they really provide a very good model system for us to understand what's, uh, to understand the genetic defects and their eventual outcome in terms of uh, these clinical conditions. As we discussed, the, there are, these conditions are inherited, meaning that these are, uh, the patients are born with a genetic defect or a condition that leads to this presentation. The presentation may not all be in the childhood. The presentation can vary, as well as the severity of the presentation can vary. In general, uh, what we do see is this, since these are syndromes, many of them would have a non hematologic clinical feature associated with them, which sometimes can be very specific, or it could be a non-specific presentation and a conglomeration of different symptoms, which will lead to an eventual uh, reason for a clinical visit and an eventual reason for clinical presentation. So um, I won't go through the entire list. I'm sure the group is familiar with uh, some of these. What I wanted to point out was that there are existing laboratory findings and conditions which are associated with these conditions where we can start understanding the, the uh, genetic findings and features. So such as the cases in Fanconi anemia where there is increased chromosomal breakage. So there is an assay available to look at the increased chromosomal breakage uh, for Fanconi anemia. Similarly for 
the disc keratosis congenita, the defect is in telomeres, and there are clinical assays available to look at short telomere lengths. And I understand that there are future uh, webinars coming up on some of these very specific uh, conditions, so I, I would not uh, go into too much details about some of those specific assays. What I do want to point out uh, uh, here is that there are conditions where there is a very specific and a singular presentation, such as the severe congenital neutropenia, where the neutropenia is the only finding and resulting uh, uh, severe infections as, as part of the neutropenia are, are the uh, presenting clinical symptoms. They all, or majority of them, they have an increased incident of associated cancers. So this is uh, this is uh, showing that there are different uh, types of associations. Many of them are associated with MDS and AML, which are the other uh, higher-grade myelodysplastic syndrome and acid myeloleukemia. They both are myeloid disorders. So there seems to be a common uh, predisposition uh, to this type of higher-grade myeloid conditions. What we have learned more recently in this in these different clinical syndromes is that a very specific defect or a molecular mechanism underlie, as the arrow is pointing to the right uh, the rightmost column. There's very specific conditions or, or defects that can uh, they are co that are uh, correlated with this type of syndromic presentation. So for Fanconi anemia, it's the defect in the DNA repair pathway. Uh, for the dyskeratosis congenita, it's the telomere biology that's defective for diamond blackman anemia, it's the ribosome uh, biogenesis and processing, so on and so forth. So we have, begun to, we have begun to understand the genetic basis of these conditions, and this again forms the basis for us to start formulating uh, the strategies for clinical molecular testing and uh, for diagnosis as well as prognosis for these patients. So just very high-level overview of uh, some of these inherited bone marrow failure syndromes, uh, uh, just to show that the conditions or the defects may arise at the level of the chromosomes. And as we know, the chromosomes are, are the structures inside our nucleus which harbor all the genetic information. And this, the chromosomes have to undergo a replication uh, during the cell. Uh, uh, cell proliferation, uh, and, and so this uh, is again a process where the genetic information which is contained within these chromosomes may be vulnerable to a change or, or what we call a mutation which would result from, from being a normal healthy cell to an abnormal or disease-prone cell. So one of the reasons, uh, the conditions uh, that are affected with Fonkeni anemia is the increase uh, in the uh, defective DNA repair and the chromosomal breakage, as we see here, and so the lower left of the panel shows the multiple proteins which are involved in maintaining and repairing, repairing the DNA damage. So there is a BRCA1 family of protein, as well as the FANC group of Fanconi group of uh, proteins and genes which are involved in maintaining the DNA repair. So as one can imagine, a defect in any of these could potentially alter the way the DNA is being repaired. And so this really forms the basis for Fanconi anemia. Similarly, uh, in conditions such as uh, uh, dyskeratosis congenita, the telomeres, which are the ends of the chromosomes, and which maintain, the, again, the integrity of the chromosomes by maintaining the, uh, the ends of the chromosomes through this telomeres complex, are defective. Again, which what that would mean is that if there is a mutation in one of these multiple proteins involved, the chromosomes will progressively get shorter and shorter, resulting into these conditions. Similarly, the ribosome uh, biogenesis affects the protein synthesis and processing uh, inside the cytoplasm, resulting into uh, the uh, uh, Schaumann diamond syndrome. So again, we are beginning to understand the players who play a role in maintaining the healthy cellular processes, which uh, ultimately would uh, form the basis for understanding the disease conditions. So this is a slide that shows uh, some of the genes that we saw in the previous slide and their mutation frequency. So uh, we have been able to understand these disease conditions through larger genomic studies and understand the uh, frequency of the mutations or the ch changes or alterations in the genes involved in the process. 
So there are uh, so so in some conditions such as Fanconi anemia and dyskeratosis congenita, multiple genes can be involved, and this also again corresponds to the size of the complexes or the protein complexes required to maintain the integrity of the DNA. But within these, there are some which are frequently mutated at higher frequency than the other. Similarly, in and DKC also there are some which are mutated at a higher frequency compared to the other ones, and and still in a large number of the patients, we still don't know the reason for the, these changes. So these are, again, complex multi, uh, multifactorial uh, types of disorders where we do understand some of these uh, bases, whereas for some of the other ones, we still have incomplete understanding. But again, seeing a list like this form would form the bases when we encounter a patient with uh, one of these conditions to see if there is a basis for uh, for the uh, clinical presentation by looking at one or more of these genes involved. Yet in another set of conditions, the bone marrow failures, uh, there are some limited genes involved, such as this example shown here, congenital amygocaryocytic thrombocytopenia has typically has defect only in MPL. Such similarly, GATA2, which is already defined by the gene name, has defect in GATA2, so on and so forth. So again, and some of these uh, explain majority of the patients who present with this clinical entity. So what this slide shows us uh, is that uh, for any of the uh, bone marrow failure syndromes, to for us to understand properly, we need to understand the clinical presentation, put together the laboratory findings and the molecular mechanism for us to then formulate the differential diagnosis and, and to be able to reach to a, a definitive diagnosis. And again, this approach forms the basis uh, for personalized care where each of these specific patient population is now being uh, investigated and, and being cared for accordingly based on the genetic uh, information that's contained within the abnormal cells. So so far, that's um, and so so far the information we saw was on the on the inherited bone marrow failure syndrome, which forms a uh, which forms a, a specific group of patients who present with uh, a, a different types of cytopenias. One of the common conditions that we see, uh, which is acquired and and they present with uh, the cytopenia in all three lineages, is the acquired aplastic anemia. As we saw earlier, uh, in among the acquired aplastic anemia, to a large extent, we had so far we had uh, what we call idiopathic uh, aplastic anemia, and the term idiopathic means that we really do not know the reason for this. And till more recently, uh, and and there was a seminal paper published about a couple of years ago, where uh, the investigators uh, Yoshihato et al. they studied about 439 patients with uh, aplastic anemia and try to understand their genetic makeup and then see if uh, these patients have uh, a, a specific uh, mutation which would form the basis. And their findings were quite interesting. What their study showed was that um, this uh, aplastic anemia, acquired aplastic anemia patients would have a somatic mutation, somatic meaning that acquired during the course of the life. Uh, are uh, there are mutations in cancer myeloid cancer candidate genes in about one third of patients interestingly these were clustered and limited to a very specific set of genes and also they were present in a very low initial variant allele frequency uh, meaning that only a subset of cells would have the mutation and this would change over a period of time so these were important findings in, in allowing us to understand that there were uh, some uh, specific somatic mutations that would form the basis for for the uh, clonal abnormalities in acquired aplastic anemia. And again, their presence would form the basis for an initial understanding and making the diagnosis. Um, these cells or these patients will also have uh, what we now call as clonal hematopoiesis, and uh, this uh, would uh, also explain the increased prevalence with the age. So the clonal hematopoiesis is is a subset of cells which carry a common genetic uh, defect and and that's what the term means it doesn't translate into the disease 
just yet. And we'll see in a future slide where the clonal hematopoiesis and somatic mutations, they all fall in place. One of the features of the uh, clonal abnormalities is their increase prevalence increases with age. And as we saw earlier, the uh, hematopoiesis is a highly coordinated process where a variety of different proteins and pathways, they really need to work in harmony. And as, as we age, uh, some of those uh, mechanisms, they start getting affected. And uh, so that would also explain the increased prevalence of these clonal abnormalities with age. So this is again some representative information uh, from from that paper. And they studied two cohorts, one from the US, one from the Japan, and they showed and identified that there are some common mutations that we see, uh, such as in B-Core or B-Core L1 uh, pathway, uh, PIG-A, uh, DNMT3A, ASXL1, JAK2, and then followed by a longer list of other um, mutations, other genes which are being affected. Interestingly, what they showed was that you could then differentiate based on the type of mutation the overall uh, survival in the patients with aplastic anemia, where it shows that if the patients with pig A, B core, or B core L1 mutation, they tend to have better overall survival as shown by this blue cow at the top with, with more percent, for, uh, percentage of patients making it to 160 month mark compared to the patients with mutation in any of these genes listed here. And the patients who have no mutations in this gene studied, they would fall in between. So again, this type of uh, additional genetic information would also identify patients who are at the high risk of, of uh, having a poor overall survival compared to the patients who are at a, uh, have a better or favorable genetic uh, makeup in, in the cells. And based on this information, uh, this type of uh, the outcome information can also be provided, which will provide the information. So as you can see, in the unfavorable group, more percentage of patients had no response as in orange, partial response as in green, or complete response as in blue. And as we move to the favorable group, the proportion changes as more patients showed a complete response to immunosuppressive therapy. Uh, and, and less patients showed no response. So again, this provides the uh, very important basis for us to understand different outcomes in patients with aplastic anemia when it comes to the immunosuppressive therapy. We take, uh, and there have been several more studies uh, uh, in understanding this little better. What this provides us is that in the clonal hematopoiesis in an acquired aplastic anemia, there are different biomarkers that we can study which will provide us the understanding of whether or not uh, this clone is going to be stable or is going to increase. And uh, naturally, the stable or decreasing clones, they have better response and better outcomes compared to the clones which are increasing with time. They have higher progression and poor overall survival. Since that study, a variety of other studies have shown, as you can see in this table, uh, multiple different uh, uh, studies studying a num large number of patients showing that the somatic mutations are in a variety of different genes and their frequencies, uh, as shown here in this table. So again, that initial finding was confirmed and, and uh, by larger cohorts and again essentially showed the same common genes such as SXL1, DNMT3A, B core, pig A, and so forth, confirming and further expanding the utility of this type of studies in, in the aplastic anemia patients. When we uh, look at this, uh, so and, and when we look at the mutations in aplastic anemia, as I pointed out earlier, some of these mutations such as DNMT3A, ASXL1, are also seen in, in other conditions such as myelodysplastic syndrome but some of them are also seen in normal individuals. So when we compare the frequency of these mutations in aplastic anemia, what we see is in the normal healthy individuals that about less than 2% of patients have some of these con conditions, some of these mutations, and they, but they are on a very small subset of uh, cells, or when we call variant allele frequency, meaning that what number of cells carry or what percentage of DNA molecules carry this uh, mutation. 
So in healthy individuals, it tends to be in a smaller subset and at a very uh, low allele frequency. In the aplastic anemia, it tends to happen, uh, and about more than 50% of patients have one of these mutations, and they do correlate with age, and, and, but they also occur initially at the low allele frequency. In comparison, when we look at the myelodysplastic syndrome, which is, the, the, uh, which is a, a condition where there are uh, obvious cytopenias and also morphologic abnormalities associated with them in the cells, they occur at many, um, about 90% of these uh, uh, patients would have some of these mutations, and also they would occur at a higher allele frequency. Their association with the different chromosomal abnormalities will be different. So what this uh, points out is that aplastic anemia and myelodysplastic syndrome, they have their own unique set of, uh, of uh, mutations and, and some of the overlapping uh, players which take part in both, but, but their mutation frequencies as well as uh, some of the other, co uh, other factors uh, such as cytogenetic factors are somewhat different. Again, this is the information from the previous slide. Uh, which highlights the need to understand the somatic mutation status in aplastic anemia so that these patients can be better stratified into favorable outcomes versus unfavorable outcomes. And this also holds true for patients under the uh, 60 years of age where some of the favorable outcome genes uh, still show a better outcome compared to some of the other unfavorable outcome genes. So when we take multiple of these studies and try to understand the disease process, uh, uh, there are several models being proposed. This is just one of them. Uh, what this suggests is that uh, from the wild-type uh, uh, hematopoietic precursor cell, uh, they can be subjected to a variety of different uh, mutations, and some of them, they are getting then attacked by these cytotoxic T lymphocytes and being cleared out of system. Some of them, they escape the uh, immune surveillance and mechanism, may acquire other mutations, and uh, may uh, come out to be having uh, to, to have other conditions such as MDS and AML. So there are multiple uh, factors at play here in terms of initially acquisition of age-related mutations. Some of these mutations would lead to increased immunogenicity, uh, whereby the T lymphocytes will attack and clear them uh, out of the system, leading to initial cytopenia. And that's one of the reasons why therapeutic interventions such as uh, uh, immunosuppressive therapies will suppress these T lymphocytes and allow the cells with these mutations to, be, uh, to survive um, and recover. But it, as you can see here, there will be a mixture of different hematopoietic cells. At some point, some of these patients also fail the immunosuppressive therapies. And, and again, these uh, genetic studies provide us the basis for understanding why the patients are failing therapy or why the patients are progressing on these therapies. So uh, that provides us a better understanding of for the aplastic anemia patients. Similarly, uh, for uh, PNH patients, we know the basis really lies in a single gene mutation, which is the pig A mutation, which is the pro anchor protein that allows these protective proteins on the surface of the red blood cells to be there and prevent this complement mediated lysis or, or, or destruction of these red blood cells. When these surface proteins are not there, the protective proteins are not there, such as the example in this, uh, in, in this uh, case with PNH, where the red blood cells, they are missing out on the protective surface proteins, they are more vulnerable to cell lysis, and, and that's the reason for, for them to have uh, hemolysis and anemia. Some of these patients now are being treated with uh, agents which prevent the, the lysis, so, so the cells, even without the surface protective uh, proteins, they can still survive because of the, uh, the blockage of the complement-mediated hemolysis. And for majority of the remaining of the talk, uh, I would uh, not have much discussion on PNH. Uh, currently, majority of the diagnosis, or the, the, the mainstay of the diagnosis is flow cytometry. And uh, I understand there is another webinar coming up on PNH and flow cytometry. I just wanted to touch upon the basis of PNH uh, for these patients um, and, and uh, why uh, a single gene mutation that can affect a variety of surface molecules and result into this type of phenotype. 
So what these studies have shown us is that hematopoiesis, because it's, it's a process that requires a continuous self renewal and also is vulnerable to this type of uh, environmental damages, it can result from having all the cells being uh, uh, healthy and normal to uh, some cells acquiring some of these mutations along the way and acquiring more and more mutations along the way uh, to the extent that there is a, now at some point there is a heterogeneous group of cells in the marrow. Some, uh, some are completely normal and some with a variable number of mutations containing within them. What we saw earlier uh, with the aplastic anemia was the cell population that uh, the number of mutations were limited and the presentation was limited to cytopenia. When it comes to myelodysplastic syndrome, some of these also translate into more cytogenetic abnormalities as well as more morphologic abnormalities. However, some of the theme seems to be the same is that sequential acquisition of cells uh, which we require in, uh, will have colonial hematopoiesis. They would be presenting with less cell counts will start showing the features in some of the abnormal cells, which will look abnormal under microscope, and the term that's the term dysplasia. Some of these abnormal swells, cells will start then proliferating and will become excess blast, which are the immature cells, and will come out as acute myeloleukemia. So in terms of the MDS to AML progression, that seems to be one of the uh, uh, currently accepted models of increasing number of mutations uh, leading to this type of aggressive disorders. Again, briefly uh, comparing the mutations in aplastic anemia and MDS, they both seem to have a unique uh, set of uh, different mutations uh, to the extent that uh, the pig A and B core mutations form nearly half of the uh, aplastic anemia mutations, whereas in MDS, they are really uh, very few or less than 5% of the mutations. Uh, in aplast in myelodysplastic syndrome, the splicing factors and TAT2 uh, and ASXL1, so splicing factor and the DNA uh, gene uh, expression really, uh, or gene expression pr uh, really forms the major group uh, of mutations that uh, lead to the myelodysplastic syndrome. There is a new, uh, really relatively recent entity we have identified. It's the uh, uh, it's called ARCH or age-related clonal hematopoiesis, or we also call it clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential. This is the condition, or this is the presentation that we see in in apparently normy, normal health individuals when they are subjected to profiling using some of these technologies. And this is the, these are the types of uh, distribution that we see. So DNMT3A forming the majority of the group here. So again, we are, as we understand this, as we profile these different entities and different patients more and more, we tend to we we are now understanding a different genetic makeup of these different entities. And uh, for completion, I'm presenting the uh, 2016 my WHO classification of myelodysplastic syndrome and related disorders such as myelodysplastic myeloproliferative neoplasm. As you could see, historically, the focus of these classifications have been more on the number of cell lines affected and the types of dysplasia or more morphologic such as ring sideroblast or excess blast. And with the identification of specific genetic mutations, now we're also moving towards having an association of say splicing factor mutations in ring sideroblast or isolated 5Q deletion syndrome uh, which characterizes a specific entity within MDS. In the, in the interest of time and also uh, uh, so since these have been well known for quite some time, I'm not going to discuss this in more in detail so that we can focus more on, on the uh, information that has more recently become available, such as in aplastic anemia. Also, for other conditions such as uh, chronic myelomonocytic leukemia, uh, atypical CML, new and, and more, more specific mutations have been identified which explain these so far uh, uh, enigmatic conditions. Now we have formal basis for these uh, different categories. And again, a base forming basis for making a personalized diagnosis as well as uh, a prognostic schema on these patients. Again, just to show the genetic landscape of myelodysplastic syndrome, we are now understanding these different mutations at a higher, uh, in, in much more details and identifying this distinct subset of MDS which are characterized by one or more of these mutations.
And what it does uh, in terms of personalized medicine is this provides a, a very uh, strong basis for taking the ex existing prognostication schema, such as International Prognostic Scoring System, IPSS, and merging them with this uh, information so that if the MDS, within the MDS, if we see mutation in any of these five genes, they really form the basis for a different survival uh, among the same conventional risk score group. So this is the low risk IPSS with mutation and, and uh, with, uh, without the mutation and with mutation, you can see a clearly different overall survival in the patients with, with the mutation, uh, without the mutation and with the mutation. And also holds true at the different, so intermediate IPSS risk score, if we see the same observation. So this really provides the additional basis for further stratifying the patients who may be under the same risk score uh, by conventional uh, classification, but now adding the molecular classification, it allows an additional level of uh, risk stratification. Similarly, uh, acute myeloid leukemia, which is the highest uh, or the most aggressive form of uh, the myeloid disorders, we have learned a lot over the years and identified many, many players which play a role. Uh, I'm not going to go into too many details of this, but again, the theme here across all the tumor types is the same, that we've been learning more and more about each, each specific entity and uh, the different mutations that we see within these entities allow us to understand this more. So uh, if you look at the spectrum of the conditions from no production to excess production, we may think there is a continuum of sort here uh, among these different entities. What the data really shows, and it's much more complex than what this shows here, is that there is a combination of immune injury and the clonal process where things don't really lead, uh, move linearly uh, in, in a linear fashion but they move in, in the uh, uh, ratio, based on the ratio of the immune, immune injury and the clonal proliferation from single uh, lineage defects such as decreased platelets or pure red cell aplasia to multiple uh, lines uh, of being defected, with, meaning only the cell uh, count being low to the uh, extent where the cell counts are low and the cells also look abnormal to the extent that cells are abnormal and they are proliferating out of control. So, and there are all these different extents uh, in between. So this, again, having the understanding of clonal processes allows us to understand these processes at much more uh, uh, at the greater levels. So I hope this was uh, a, a, a very um, a solid background and overview of why we need to understand uh, the genetic testing. Because without this background, uh, the genetic testing would really not form a much, a much of a, a scientific basis, but hopefully this was able to show that we have identified enough genetic information, enough genetic drivers of these conditions, and also enough clinical correlates so that we now need to understand uh, the genotypes of these tumors or these entities uh, to start integrating them into the clinical care. So in the few minutes left, um, I'll try to touch upon some of the clinical testing and interpretation of these conditions. Uh, historically, our hematologic diagnosis uh, has been uh, limited for as far as uh, when it comes to non-morphologic studies. Uh, cytogenetics has been the mainstay for many, many years, uh, followed by a more recent implication of the massively parallel sequencing or the next generation sequencing, where we can sequence multiple genes at the same time. Um, and this has become available in a relatively short period of span, but it has really changed the way we understand and diagnose and, and, and treat these patients. So uh, I'll focus a little bit more on, on the, uh, the technologies which have become related, recently uh, become available so as to provide more uh, recent contact. So for the patients who present with uh, this uh, bone marrow failure, uh, meaning that uh, decreased counts or, or uh, abnormal cells, the, generally, their common presentation is cytopenia. Unfortunately, uh, the patient, uh, when at the first presentation, it's it's really not uh, uh, very clear whether this is in constitutional or acquired. Is this because of a transient or a temporary environmental condition or a viral infection, or if this is a, a clonal process which will require close monitoring and possible treatments? So a variety of different factors need to be incorporated, such as clinical history, family history, 
uh, laboratory findings, existing studies, uh, technologies such as telomere length, chromosomal breakage, if there is a constitutional bone marrow failure uh, in consideration. If the somatic genetics is, in, is, is or a acquired bone marrow condition is in consideration, then again cytogenetics, FISH, or, or chromosomal care, or, or next generation sequencing are uh, the options when it comes to the somatic conditions. Uh, I would skip this in the interest of time, but the information uh, would hopefully be available on the on the webinar or on the slide deck there. What this shows is the um, uh, in aplastic anemia, there are specific chromosomal abnormalities which uh, also predict uh, the risk for progression uh, to AML, whereas in myelodysplastic syndrome, these are more uh, well characterized. Uh, and and, and uh, there are also significantly uh, when there is a multiple of these abnormalities such as in complex karyotype, they tend to portend poorer prognosis. The tools for performing the cytogenetic analysis, meaning looking at the chromosomes for abnormalities, the historical and, and, and still in, in a popular use is the conventional karyotype where uh, we grow the cells in, in the culture uh, and look at the chromosomes in, in those cells and look for any abnormalities in the shapes uh, or numbers of the chromosomes. Sometimes they we run into limitation because of the resolution as well as a potential uh, dilution of the myeloid cells, which are the target cells in, in this case, by other non-myeloid such cells such as lymphoid cells. So to overcome that and to provide a better resolution on a specific target, we use a technology such, uh, called a FISH, or fluorescence in situ hybridization, where we use fluorescently labeled probes for specific regions of the genome or the chromosome and, and look for any changes in the number or, or the location of these uh, cells. More recently, uh, technologies such as microarray has become available, and I'll show some examples of this where we can now look at a specific, chrom specific location at even higher resolution then the FISH allows, and it's particularly, uh, particularly relevant for aplastic anemia, where we need not only the number of the, the, uh, the locus, also we need the source, meaning that if it came from the one parent cell or, or from two different parent cells in form of a loss of hydrozygosity, which is seen in about 13% of the patients. So again, it's important to, to use the right diagnostic tool and technique for this, uh, the tools, as I mentioned, for uh, genetic analysis are conventional karyotyping. Uh, it can provide complete coverage, but limited resolution. In comparison, the array-based array uh, platforms can provide complete resolution and at a higher resolution. Uh, so again, they all have a place in the workup, and depending on the presentation and, and the diagnostic question, one or more of these technologies can be can be deployed uh, in understanding the the condition a little bit more. So together, what this provides is us is that for uh, there is a different group or different types of abnormalities involved, even in normal aging, which will include this set of genes and their proportion compared to the acquired uh, aplastic anemia, where P and H cells tend to predominate, followed by 6P uh, copy number uh, uh, LOH, uh, followed by some of these uh, genes, whereas in MDS, uh, their distribution is uh, quite different. So, and as I mentioned, when uh, during the earlier workup, now some of this distinction is not clear because the workup is done to identify to, uh, whether one of these conditions are there. So that creates a, a challenge for, for diagnostic workup in that we want to be complete and at the same time we want to be focused so that it's cost efficient. And at the same time, we also want to make it personalized in, in that now we have generated a variety of different mutations or information on variety of different mutations as shown in this little uh, table here, their frequency and their clinical correlates. Uh, to the extent that if we leave out some of these from the diagnostic workup, we may or may not be uh, looking at the complete picture. And this creates a challenge for us in that uh, we really need to start looking at more and more genes all at the same time so that we can start understand and, and get a very comprehensive assessment. Uh, I won't go into too much details, but this, uh, this uh, publication highlights very nicely 
the genes and, and their associations in different types of entities and different uh, frequencies. So with that, uh, we come to this, uh, 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 this clinical challenge where not too long ago, majority of the molecular labs would be only performing single gene assays to now to the current state uh, that we are now being asked to perform multiple genes or look at multiple genes in multiple different tumor types. As I mentioned, when a patient presents with cytopenia, it's unclear whether it's going to turn out to be aplastic anemia, MDS, or any of these other conditions. So we want to be comprehensive, but at the same time, we want to be focused uh, to make it uh, to, uh, for the clinical care. For till uh, about five years ago, our choices were limited to some of the technologies. We could only do a single or limited number of genes and could only perform a specific type of mutation analysis. So this slide here shows uh, the types of platforms such as Sanger sequencing, pyrosequencing, capillary electrophoresis, and the types of mutations they can interrogate. Again, this creates a challenge in that looking at a number of genes at the same time, it really becomes virtually impossible uh, for using these single gene platforms. And uh, that's where the invention or, or the uh, migration of next generation sequencing, which is a technique where it allows us to sequence multiple genes all at the same time at a very higher sensitivity and higher throughput. Uh, and looking at all possible types of changes in these genes uh, really enables us to cast a wider net and look at more comprehensively across the entire genome or the set of genomes. So we have now different applications where we can do whole genome sequencing, we can look at the RNA sequencing, or what's more popular currently is the uh, Amplicon-based deep sequencing where we define the regions of the genome. So in cases of a, uh, aplastic anemia and MDS, we would define the regions of the genome where we would want to look at a higher frequency, a higher sensitivity, and identify uh, these mutations at the level of single point mutation or in insertions and deletions. So this technology has really uh, uh, matured and has become a clinical grade technology where we can start uh, understanding uh, these conditions much more uh, in, in details. This is just an example of how one of the panel would look like and the content can be completely customized or can some of the panels uh, are available also commercially. Uh, and as uh, this uh, little schematic shows here, it can look at the point mutation, meaning the single change in the nucleotide, or insertion of an abnormal sequence of the DNA, or deletion of the DNA sequence. What all of these lead to is, is and, and also we can look at the changes in the copy number, meaning that these little dots present the ratio of the DNA, so when the ratio is to the uh, below the green dotted lines, it's a loss. When the ratio is above the dotted lines, it's a gain. So again, by design, we can start interrogating in the same panel, uh, not only the point mutations, but also changes in the copy number insertions and uh, the, in, I mean copy number gains. I wanted to focus last couple of minutes on understanding the the scope and the uh, the limitations of the assay. I'm sure uh, many of you would have seen uh, some of these next generation sequencing results coming out of one of the clinical laboratories. We all follow different templates and, and uh, in reporting, uh, so some standardization is, is uh, already being, being planned and being discussed. Uh, but just to understand this from a higher perspective, no, no two next generation sequencing assays are alike. A lot of them are designed within the lab uh, with, with keeping in mind the patient population that they are serving. They use a variety of strategies for covering the target regions. They have different uh, regions within these genes which uh, we are trying to interrogate. We use different sequencing approach. We use different informatics approach, and we also uh, look uh, at the, what we call as a depth of coverage or, or how deep or what's the sensitivity of the assay. So combining all of these uh, will provide you a, a comprehensive understanding. So when, we, uh, when you look at the results, you want to look to see if the assay covered all of the coding sequence. Did it also cover some of the sequences which are outside of the coding sequence? 
they recovered the the codon or the uh, or the hot spot that was a most uh, of the most interest they did cover a variety of different uh, changes in the dna and did it also reach a level of sensitivity that it's it is uh, supposed to reach and understand uh, the nomenclature of the mutations which are being presented as i mentioned some of the standardized ways of reporting these mutations are there sometimes we only refer to a part of the string as a colloquial terminology uh, and but there is a standardized string where it is supposed to show a gene name the change at the dna level and the change at the protein level for us to understand uh, the differences um, and just showing uh, briefly how three letter dna sequences would result into a specific amino acid so if the sequences change a different amino acid would result and that's the basis of what we call the uh, mutations and and the terminology of uh, the gene uh, would be wild type meaning the normal configuration of a dna sequence a missense mutation meaning only a single nucleotide change but it changes the nuclear amino acid from one to the other a nonsense mutation meaning a single nucleotide change but it results in a stop codon meaning no more protein being uh, incorporated no more amino acids being incorporated so there is a variety of different terminology uh, that we def they, we refer to to show what is the actual change and the impact on the dna and on the dna and the protein function so again uh, some familiarity with with this type of uh, nomenclature would be helpful in understanding that a silent mutation meaning that there is no change so a tac to tat would lead to the same amino acid uh, tyrosine as is shown here and this would likely be a benign change meaning that it will not affect change the the protein uh, structure or the function so there is a lot in involved in terms of understanding the mutations uh, the mutations which are well known are somewhat easy to establish the known associations but as we sequence the more and more genes and more and more variants we are found find what we are finding is that we are discovering variants where we there has not been any literature on this before or there has not been any studies and so to assign a uh, specific clinical threshold or or specific uh, clinical abnormalities on onto some variants which haven't been studied before can sometimes be challenging especially in constitutional setting so again uh, we are generating a, a, a lot of information but at the same time some of the clinical correlates we still need to develop and understand so it needs to be still placed in the context of clinical presentation the morphologic presentation and other laboratory findings and to permit that there has been many of many different tools which are available online where you can take one of the variants that you identify and look for so also including md anderson cancer center uh, there is a personalized cancer therapy website uh, and similar efforts from variety of uh, different commercial as well as publicly funded sources to assign uh, the uh, the clinical significance of the variants that we identify on on this next generation sequencing platform and so at the conclusion have we solved the the issue of aplastic anemia myelodysplastic syndrome and cytopenia or have we made it more confusing um, so here's what we have uh, discovered so far uh, so uh, hope uh, through the presentation we were able to see that there is a common theme uh, in terms of presentation with the cytopenia under understanding or identifying a clonal abnormality and linking uh, them to the clinical presentation so if you take the combination of these three we end up with a variety of different conditions and depending on what's known or what's known known not known uh we've been now increasing our uh, acronym uh, uh, uh four three to four letter acronyms uh, here as shown here where uh arc stands for age related clonal hematopoiesis when there is no cytopenia but there is a clonal abnormality and these are generally considered to be benign chip stands for this uh, clonal hematopoiesis of indeterminate potential and again but the variant frequency is higher and the condition is uh, and but this is generally uh, not known uh, the chop stands for the ones with the oncologic potential where there is increased risk of malignancy i uh, stands for the cases where there is uh, some dysplasia 
uh, in bone marrow, but there is no cytopenia or there may or may not be a clonal abnormality. ICUS stands for idiopathic cytopenia, where there is a cytopenia, but there is no clonal abnormality. And sometimes there is clonal abnormality and cytopenia, but there is no morphologic dysplasia, which is a requirement for MDS. Uh, these are considered CECUS, or clonal cytopenia of undetermined significance. So overall, what we are seeing is that we are increasing our knowledge and understanding. At the same time, we are stratifying uh, our uh, stratifying the patient presentations into many, many more groups uh, than what we did uh, in the past. But uh, this hopefully is allowing us to again reach to, towards that goal of personalized care where we assign a very specific risk uh, for these patients based on their specific genotype. So in summary, uh, complex molecular genetic abnormalities underlie the bone marrow failure syndromes and the uh, powerful uh, genomic technologies such as next generation sequencing microarray, they allow comprehensive assessment uh, and development of personalized management plan for the patients. And uh, needless to say that the ongoing studies, they continue to add to our understanding of relationship among the bone marrow disorders and their clinical significance uh, for genomic findings. And I just leave the group with uh, some of the online resources which are available to understand uh, some of these conditions more and also to identify some of the testing uh, that may be available uh, for, for these type of conditions. So with that, uh, I end my presentation here and I'll be uh, happy to take any questions. Uh, and thank you all for, for uh, calling in and, and uh, listening to this webinar. Thank you. Great. Thank you very, thank you very much. And we did have a few questions um, that have come in. Uh, Fred is an MDS patient and has um, been having blood transfusions. Usually receives two blood transfusions, um, which had increased his hemoglobin by two points. Lately, um, with two blood transfusions, his hemoglobin is only increased by one. Um, any thoughts on what may be causing this? Um, yeah, so uh, I guess uh, so. Uh, as we mentioned earlier on, on the patient, so assuming that this patient has a uh, patient equation has established diagnosis of MDS, uh, there could be a change in the in the clonal uh, uh, architecture, as we saw earlier in one of my slides. Here, let me see if I can go back to that slide. Uh, one of the uh, uh, condition uh, things to keep in mind is there is there may be some immune component and sometimes with uh, increasing transfusions uh, some antibodies develop which may not allow the the level of hemoglobin to rise uh, to the extent that it, it would have risen earlier uh, and so it could be a combination of multiple things where uh, the uh, combination of immune uh, a response to the transfusions or a change in the clonal status of, of the uh, native clonal cells could explain this. Okay. Um, any suggestions on how he can approach his doctor and um, with any suggestions on what he may, how he would start the conversation and what he may say? Um, I guess the, the starting point of the conversation could be that the, the increasing uh, transfusion requirement and the diminishing response and, and to understand what cause, uh, again, the treating clinician would be in the best position to provide an overall assessment and, and see what else is going on with the patient. But, but I think these two points, the questions that were raised here, are, are would be very, uh, I guess, the appropriate uh, starting for the conversation to see what uh, if we need to, if you need to do anything to explain this or not sure if there has been a regularly scheduled uh, follow up different centers tend to follow different uh, follow up protocols in terms of looking at the bone marrow uh, at a periodic intervals to see if there is been a change in the status uh, of the marrow itself uh, and and the cells within the marrow but i think starting with the with the uh, the observations about increasing transfusion requirement uh, would be appropriate, and also not sure if the patient is on any specific therapy, then uh, loss of response to the therapy may also be another factor uh, which could play a role in, 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 in decreasing uh, response and increasing requirement for transfusion. Great. Thank you very much. Um, this question comes from Mary. Her father passed away from severe aplastic anemia 
she would like to know if it would benefit her to have genetic testing um, for these gene mutations, and if so, um, where could she have that done? Oh, that's, that's an excellent question. Um, so we, as we saw uh, uh, in one of the first slides, so please bear with me as I try to go back to the slide here, is that aplastic anemia, or what we consider aplastic anemia, is many uh, different clinical conditions. And uh, depending on whether or not uh, the uh, aplastic anemia um, that uh, your father had, uh, and I'm, I'm uh, sorry to hear about uh, his uh, severe aplastic anemia in passing, is that aplastic anemia could mean any of the inherited conditions, and each of them, they have a very specific uh, presentation, or it could be many of these uh, other acquired conditions, including uh, many which are idiopathic, which whereby we would not we would not know the reason for uh, the condition, as well as uh, some of the uh, secondary uh, conditions. So again, uh, if you are concerned and outside of the uh, outside of the uh, routine annual visits, if you have noted any any uh, uh, symptoms or, or conditions uh, uh, related to in increased infections, bleeding, or or uh, uh, low hemoglobin, those would be the uh, definitely the reasons. And and also during the uh, annual visits, discussing with your care provider uh, about your concerns, I think that would be a good starting point where they can look at your overall health, your overall counts, uh, and and see if there is a need. Uh, uh, to 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 investigate this uh, any further. Thank you. And uh, we have a question from Tobin. Um, he would they would like to know how does the uh, pig A mutation evolve and differ from or versus another genetic inherited disease. Uh, so that's again a great question. So I'm, I'm 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 really impressed with the acumen of the the uh, with the audience here, and thank you for uh, the, all these uh, interesting questions. Um, let me see if I can go to one of the slides. Um, so pig A uh, is is uh, in in different studies have been shown as also an indicator of uh, genotoxicity, meaning that uh, the mutations in pig A could refer to the amount of DNA damage or, or amount of uh, the uh, DNA exposure to a variety of different um, uh, environmental as well as other toxins that could have uh, uh, been there. What uh, it shows is that for specific pig A mutations, they would uh, result into this very specific loss of the surface proteins uh, and because pig A is is the uh, the anchor protein that anchors all of these uh, different su uh, surface uh, proteins which protect, and so by way of uh, damaging the pig A mutation, it it uh, it uh, results into this very specific loss of of uh, proteins on the cell surface, and that's how it leads to the uh, PNH. Some of these other mutations uh, we don't really understand the the pathways which uh, uh, some of these other mutations take uh, in terms of uh, understanding of their their uh, specific pathogenesis. What we know is there is a specific association when these genes get mutated, uh, their presentation would more likely be aplastic anemia uh, compared to these other genes. So, for example, we saw in uh, some of the studies have shown that B core and pig A when they are lost, they'll be more in a plastic anemia setting, whereas in DNMT3A can also be seen in MDS and AML setting. So we don't really know what uh, specific uh, mechanisms lead to this type of a damage, um, and, and that would be the, the focus of future studies where we take this type of cohorts, we take understand their common conditions, and, and identify common uh, exposures they may have had and, and at the demographic level and, and work backwards from there and say pig A mutation in a specific cohort, maybe this is the reason and so uh, so on and so forth, so BCOR and uh, BCOR L1. As you could see from some of these publication dates, these are relatively recent studies. So we are, just simply, uh, we are still at the very beginning of our understanding of what could lead to one mutation versus the other. I hope that answers the question. 
Great. Thank you. And we have one more question. Uh, for patients who um, have been diagnosed 10 years plus, um, would they now also benefit from this type of testing? Okay. Yeah. So that's that's another great question. So uh, again, um, the response to that question would be uh, that uh, this type of testing is indicated or is useful uh, at the at the beginning of the diagnosis, so that we make a very specific diagnosis, and also at any important treatment decisions that need to be made, or at any at changes in the patient status, meaning that if you start seeing the hemoglobin drop, or, or if you see the uh, the neutrophils counts drop, or if you see loss of response, I think those are the indications where uh, this would really benefit, uh, these patients would benefit from undergoing this type of testing, where we could now see if there has been a change in the clonal dynamics, where, uh, so for example, I think there was a, yeah, so here, this shows that at the baseline, maybe there is one mutation. So if the transition from one to the other is not always linear, but uh, for patients who are relatively stable uh, and has not experienced any change in the status, uh, the value would again be determined based on, on how the patient's overall presentation and how overall response to any treatment is. But definitely, when whenever there is a significant change in the status, that those would be a good time point uh, for for the patients to get get profiled and um, and again if the diagnosis made 10 years ago if it wasn't uh, a specific uh, in in the sense that uh, uh, the aplastic anemia versus M MDS again some of this uh, uh, testing would help uh, with the stratification of the uh, overall prognosis of so an example shown here for aplastic anemia, the mutation status does provide a different prognosis and, and different risk for other conditions. So again, uh, my recommendation would be to discuss some of these uh, uh, observations and, and with the care provider and, and, and understand the risk benefit ratio of, of getting the testing done now or, or uh, what would be the implications of understanding uh, this at more at the genomics level at this point in care. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Um, I, we don't have any other further questions at this time. And Dr. Patel, I'd like to thank you for your wonderful presentation and taking your time today uh, to be with us. Um, oh, my pleasure, I, my pleasure. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I'd just like to remind everyone um, that you will be able to rewatch this webinar at a later time, so please be on the lookout for an email uh, which will provide you with the archives linked in seven to four business days. On behalf of the Aplastic Anemia and MDS International Foundation, I would like to thank each of you for joining us on the presentation today and making us your resource of choice for information on bone marrow failure diseases. If we were not able to answer your question today, please be sure to send us an email at help at aamds.org so that we will be able to answer your question, or you can also visit our online academy at aamds.org slash learn, where you'll find other interviews with experts and other programs that may address your question. As a final reminder, as soon as I'm done speaking, a post-event survey uh, will appear requesting your feedback. Please take time to fill out the survey. Again, thank you for joining us, and remember, learning is hope. This concludes today's program.